Greetings, everyone. This is National Chess Master Jonathan Hilton here with another Ford Chess Moment. One question that I've been getting from a lot of club players lately is, if you play the open games with black, so you're responding to one e4 with one e5, what do you do against a molar? And in order to answer this question and recommend what I believe to be black's strongest option, I've turned to um, Victor Bulligan's excellent book, Bulligan's Black Weapons in the Open Games. I have found this to be a very useful book myself, and uh, Victor Bulligan actually highlights some systems that I've been playing with black for a number of years. So what I'm going to do is take you through his suggestion, but also incorporate some of my own games and my own practice to give you the best possible repertoire against a molar. So I am going to jump to the molar attack in the book, and the position that we are going to be focusing on is this one. I will show it to you, and then I will work backwards so that you know how we got there. Today we are going to be taking a look at this endgame, which if you are playing against the molar, you generally should be able to get with the black pieces at the club level. It's not exactly an endgame, it's a queenless middle game, and black is going to have this light squared bishop in exchange for a knight, and black has actually pretty good winning chances here. I've played this position five times, I've won four games and only drawn one, so I believe this to be black's very best response to the molar. So how do we get here? How do we reach this queenless middle game? Well, I'll skip all of the way back to the very beginning of the game and show you the molar attack. White plays e4, black plays e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, bishop c5, c3, knight f6. And here, rather than opting for a quiet game with d3, white busts open the center with pawn to d4. Black takes... And here, pawn takes pawn is the most common move for white. Black plays bishop to b4 check. And there are a number of moves for here, here for white, as you can see, just by looking through a tremendous number of options. But the only move that I have ever played against, and the only move that I think is popular at all at the club level, is bishop to d2, which is actually a fairly quiet move for white. If we go back a little, this isn't the only way that we can reach the molar attack. I've also had players play a sort of scotch gambit against me. Uh, they play pawn to, to d4, I take it, and then they play bishop c4. Well, not to worry with black, I simply respond bishop c5. White offers up the pawn with c3, and then rather than getting greedy and, and taking the pawn, which I think actually gives white uh, very nice chances, particularly at the club level, I've always responded with a solid knight to f6. White really has nothing better than taking, and then I play bishop to b4 check, and we're back where we started. So there are a couple of different ways that we can get to the molar, and I think it's very important that... Uh, players with a black pieces who are playing the open games have something very solid that they can trot out against this because it's so beloved by club players especially who really love to attack. So going now to the line that I recommend, bishop to b4 check, bishop to d2, and here... White has a very nice pawn center with his pawns on d4 and e4, so black simply grabs a pawn on e4. This isn't quite as greedy as it seems because white's bishop on d2 is under attack, and white very naturally has to play uh, a move like bishop takes b4. Uh, of course, white can't simply get away with something like castling because the, the bishop on d2 is threatened. So... White plays bishop takes d4, black plays knight takes b4, bishop takes f7, 
This is a really key move for white. White is down a pawn in this position, and black is ready to just castle and get out of trouble. Uh, he'll be completely out of harm's way, so white has to stay on the offense and play bishop takes f7 check. Black plays king takes. White plays queen to b3, forking the black king and the knight on b4. And here the move uh, d5 has been played uh, a number of times for black, and Victor Bolagon actually writes about it fairly extensively. I've never fully trusted the move because, of course, it gives white this very nice outpost on e5. And actually, after knight e5 check, the best move for black is king to e6, which, uh, although fully playable and a very nice try for a win in some lines, I think, doesn't quite strike my fancy because if you're playing against someone who is playing the Muller, they probably want to have a good shot at attacking your king. So instead, I opt for king to f8, which is a very solid, normal mainline move. White plays queen takes b4, and now here I play queen to e7. White plays queen takes e7, and black plays king takes. So here I will just go to this position in the book. Let me jump right to it. You'll be able to see the moves again so that you can remember them. Takes. <clears throat> okay. So what can we say about this endgame position for both sides? Well, white uh, might have a very, very slight lead in development because black's bishop on c8 will take at least two moves to develop. But on the other hand, white has an isolated queen pawn on d4, and black has a bishop for a knight. So black's plan is mostly going to revolve around activating his light squared bishop and trying to control the light squares. There are two main I ideas for white uh, in, in terms of how he can proceed. The first is that he can maintain an isolated queen pawn, and the second is that he can play a move like knight to c3, hoping to create a so-called hanging pawn situation where he has the pawn on c3 and the pawn on d4. And at the club level, my experience has been that knight to c3 is the most common. However, I don't believe that it's the, the best move for white by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I do want to give you one game that I played with black that I think will illustrate some of the problems with knight to c3. So black should respond with knight takes, and white will play pawn takes. And white feels good about this transaction because he has bolstered his pawn on d4, which he previously saw as weak. The problem for white is that his pawn on a2 actually is now uh, an isolated pawn, and believe it or not, it is going to come under attack when black manages to put a bishop on d5 or c4. And then additionally, black has the c4 outpost for his bishop. So Victor Bolagon recommends the move d6 here, um, I, I think that this is probably the best move uh, for black. In the game that I played back in 2008 in this line, I played uh, rook to e8, which I think is also a natural move, but uh, I think the, that the move d6 that Bulligan recommends is a little bit more flexible. My opponent did a very natural thing here and centralized his king, but then I played pawn to d6. Uh, white took off a pair of rooks. Often uh, players who have the white pieces here will do that. I'm. I think that it is. Oh, uh, I think that it's mostly just because they can't figure out anything else to do. Um. <clears throat> so.
I, I don't think that it, it actually has that much strategic value for white to take off a pair of rooks. But uh, here my opponent played rook to b1. This is a natural move, just tickling my pawn on b7 and keeping my bishop locked away on c8. And I, I responded to this with a rather strange prophylactic move, one that I wouldn't play again. I, I played pawn to h6. And my opponent met it with an even stranger move. He played pawn to h4. I think he might have been worried about me playing pawn on g7 to g5. This was sort of a, a waiting move, and if I had this position again, I would probably just go ahead and play pawn to b6 in order to free my bishop and perhaps go ahead and fianchetto my bishop along the long h1, a8 diagonal. So... After I played pawn to h6, my opponent here had a nice idea that he missed that I want to highlight because I think it has some really important strategic relevance. In this kind of position, white really should play the move pawn to d5 because even though it is fixing white's pawn on a light square, and normally the rule is when you are playing against a, uh, a bishop, you want to put your pawns on opposite colored squares from that bishop, uh, presumably so that your opponent can't capture them. Here, this that kind of strategy would really backfire. If white plays pawn to d5, well, black is going to play a move like b6 in order to uh, activate his light squared bishop. Then, uh, white can probably play something simple like knight to d4. If black continues with something like bishop to b7, white can go ahead and play pawn to c4. And you notice that the pawns on c4 and d5 form a complete barrier against this bishop on b7. So this would have been fairly uncomfortable for me. Um, luckily for me, my opponent completely missed that idea, and, and he played h4. Um, I responded then with b6, and here again, I think the, the move d5 was probably best, but my opponent instead played the rather strange-looking knight to e1, hoping to centralize his knight. And this is the point in the game where this light-squared control really takes place. I played bishop to b7, white played pawn to g3, I played king to d7. I think it's usually best in these structures for black to be able to develop his king on the queen side in order to play uh, against white's weak a2, c3, and d4 pawns. We'll see uh, some more around this thematic idea in the future, too, um, in some other lines recommended by Bologon. White played knight to d3, and then I was able to play rook to f8, activating my rook. White played rook e1, bishop d5. So you see how this light squared bishop is really coming into play. White played a3, now I played bishop to c4. This is getting to be very, very uncomfortable uh, for white. I'm threatening to play bishop takes d3 and take the pawn on f2. So white played rook to f1, which uh, runs him into even more trouble because now the knight on d3 is, uh, is pinned to the rook on f1. So I simply played rook to f3 here. My opponent, in order to save his knight on, on d3, played knight to e1. But then I just threw in the intermezzo, rook takes c3, king takes c3, and bishop takes f1. So I went on to win this game fairly easily because uh, I was just up upon at this point. So going back, what I would like for the viewers to take from this is that when white has opted to play knight to c3, Black should play knight takes, pawn takes, and then try to get a bishop onto the light squares and take advantage of uh, 
the d5 and c4 squares. The line that Victor Bolagon recommends with d6 does this fairly easily. So for instance here, uh, if white castles, then black would just play bishop e6, rook e1, king d7. Keep Again, like I said, keeping that king on the queen side in order to eventually have uh, a shot at playing king to c6, and then king to b5, and king to c4, and so on, uh, later on in the endgame. Um, knight d2, rook, eight, uh, rook on a to e8. And uh, here, black undoubtedly has a slight edge, thanks to his well-developed pieces, the pressure he has on the a2 pawn, and his potential along the light squares. So knight to c3, although certainly the most common at the club level, I think is not best. Um, one move that that I faced uh, with the black pieces one time was knight on uh, was knight on b to d2, and uh, again I want to highlight the importance for black of trying to keep a good grip on the light squares. So in this particular game, uh, I. I fell into some very serious trouble because after knight on b to d2, I played knight takes d2 almost automatically. Um, I was used to seeing the move knight to c3. I would always take knight takes c3 there. I always had good results. So when I saw the move knight uh, bd2, I also just uh, almost automatically played knight takes d2. Uh, however, here, after king takes d2, uh, I simply played my normal rook on uh, or rook to e8, just as you saw in the previous game. My opponent played rook to e1 check. I played king to f8, uh, and we exchanged rooks here. White played rook to e1 check. I brought my king to f8, and my opponent played a very strong move here. And we've seen this idea once before, but this will really bring it home for you, I think. White played pawn to d5. The idea is very straightforward. If I were to play pawn to d6, I would have uh, immense difficulty with my pawn on c7. White could simply play rook to c1, and um, I, it appears to me that I'm just losing a pawn there. If I play something like pawn to c6, of course white would play pawn to d6, followed by rook to e7, and I will never be able to develop my bishop on c8. Um, so uh, I, I did the only thing that I could come up with, um, I, and I played pawn to c5. Just looking at my other options, pawn to b6 would run into something like knight d4, and then uh, after bishop b7, white could play... Oh, something like knight to b5 here. Um, <clears throat> the idea being, of course, if I play bishop takes d5, there's this awful fork with my rook on a8 and my bishop on d5. So, the only move that I could think to play was pawn to c5, and uh, then my opponent played uh, a move that I think was indeed very accurate, he played d6. So you see, white has completely shut out this bishop on c8. Um, I, I played rather sheepishly, I played the move a5. I was trying to play rook to a6 and think of some way in order to activate my rook. Um, this, is, this is not very pretty. And uh, white played knight to g5. I played rook to a6, and then white simply held on with knight to e4. Um, and uh, this position, white undoubtedly has an edge. I did go on to eventually draw the game, but my bishop on c8 is in a very precarious position, and white has a fairly straightforward plan of just bringing his king closer to the center with something like king to c3 and then playing his rook on e1 to d1, and then into d5, where it will begin to really hit and annoy all of my different pieces.
Um, <clears throat> so, uh, although I, I drew that game, I would never want to, never want to play a position like that again. So, when my opponent played knight on b to d2, I should not have took, or I should not have taken the knight on d2, but rather I should have played the move that Victor Bolagon recommends, which is simply knight to f6. The key here is that black really wants to control the light squares and blockade the isolated queen pawn on d4. So, if white castles, for instance, black can play d6, rook e1 check, black plays king to d7. Again, keeping the king closer to the queen side, as I mentioned, I think that that gives black more winning chances. And then, oh, here uh, on a move like knight to e4, black can play knight to d5 with uh, fairly good winning chances. Now, particularly at the club level, because uh, white will have some trouble holding this kind of an endgame, I think. Because black has his king defending the pawn on c7, and that's really the only big weakness in black's position. And black has blockaded the isolated queen pawn. He will play b6, and then bishop to b7, in order to activate his light squared bishop and he will have no problems. So, knight to c3 is bad, and knight on b to d2 I think can very adequately be met by knight to f6. So, uh, the key question here is actually what should black play against the simple move castling? And here is where I would like to show you a very, very nice move that Victor Bulligan uh, has come up with for his book. And it's actually the remarkable move, King to D8. The move that I had always played for many years was Rook to E8 here. Um, but, it, well, and the idea is fairly simple. On Knight to C3, I would simply take, and this has all of the same problems for white that we've already discussed, um, and then if uh, knight to d2, black could either take here because there is no king takes d2, which would allow, which allows white to have a centralized king, or he can play what is probably the best move uh, and simply play knight to f6. But of course, instead of playing knight on b to d2 or knight to c3, if we just go back to this position, it appears that white has a, a very nice little subtle idea, and that's to play rook to e1, which I think is a very natural move. And then black has to make a choice as to which way to go with this king. If he plays king to d8, which on, on the one hand would be the thematic move because black wants to keep his king on the queen side, where he is then able to take advantage of his 4-3 to three pawn majority later on in the game. Uh, if he plays this, white will simply play knight to e5, and the black knight on e4 is in a little bit of trouble. Uh, for instance, knight to f6 would lose comically to knight f7 checkmate. So here, black probably would end up playing a move like d5, which I don't think is very comfortable because it allows the knight on e5 to really shine. In fact, if we turn Stockfish on, it's already showing a nice half pawn advantage for white. So, king to d8 does not work, but on king to f8, moving the king away from the defense of the queenside pawns, white has a very nice idea knight to a3. The idea then is to play knight to b5, which will tickle the pawn on c7. And black doesn't have a very convincing way to deal with this threat. I think that the best he can come up with is something like d5, so that on knight to b5, black can play rook to e7. Nevertheless, 
this is not the kind of position that I would want to play with black because black has had to fix his pawn on d5. This does two things. First, it gives white the e5 outpost for his knight. And then secondly, black's bishop on c8 will never be able to get the kind of light square dominance that we saw in my first game earlier on. And that is how black gets most of his winning chances. So I think the move knight to a3 is very nice. I've never had to play against it myself, but uh, luckily I never will have to because instead of my move rook to e8, Victor Bolagon has come up with a very flexible idea of playing king to d8 first. This protects the pawn on c7 and also allows black to keep his king on the queen side, which is where, from a strategic standpoint, he wants it to be. So then, if white plays rook to e1, which I think is the most natural move, black can play knight to f6 with the idea of, after knight to g5, threatening knight to f7 checkmate, black can simply play rook to f8. I don't think that black has any problems in this position. So, for instance, on knight to c3, black could simply play uh, a move like d6, if white plays d5, which I think is probably a good move, like I, I mentioned earlier, white should be looking for a chance to play this and try to restrain the black bishop on c8. Um, black can just play bishop to f5, and uh, black really doesn't have any problems here. He has managed to develop his light squared bishop. He doesn't have the same kind of light squared dominance that we've seen in earlier games, However, he does have good play, probably eventually against the pawn on d5, and uh, a very active position. So, I very much like this move from Victor Bulagon, king to d8, uh, and I think that it allows black to retain very good winning chances. I think that this whole line against the Muller gives black very good winning chances. I've had great success with it myself, so I would highly recommend it. I also highly recommend Victor Bolgon's book on the open games um, because I think that it's very rare that you get such a high-level player taking a look at some of these very old lines and uh, coming up with new ideas. So again, I think it's a real gem of a book. So thank you for watching. I wish you the best of success against the Molar attack, and I will see you on the next 4 Chess Moment.